I think we're ready to go. Am I being heard? Okay, folks, I will call our meeting to order. Thank you all for being here. Um, just go over a few meeting logistics uh, to get started. Anyone who's joining us remotely, I would appreciate it if you would change your uh, for na your name display to your fir the first and last name so we know who we're talking to and who's talking to us. Anyone who speaks similarly, we'd ask you to state your name and where you live. Uh, we would ask you to keep any comments questions to uh, three minutes and uh, city staff will help us in uh, keeping track of the time. Anyone who is uh, speaking about a specific agenda item, please keep your comments germane to that item. Anyone who wishes to speak must be called upon by the mayor. Once you're called, you may make a statement or ask questions and uh, Again, limit your comments to three minutes. Anyone who speaks out of turn, goes on too long, or discuss, discusses non-germane topics will may be reminded to uh, come back within the scope. And uh, we're always uh, happy to accept uh, written comments from anyone who uh, wishes to <clears throat> make them. And those are uh, shared with the the entire council. Um, next is to approve the agenda. Any suggested changes to the agenda? Oh, and uh, we have two members uh, appearing remotely, so I'll call on them to uh, introduce themselves. Tim Heaney. And Tim Heaney, District 3. And Palin. Helen Cohn, District 2. Thank you. Okay, hearing no suggested uh, changes to the agenda, we'll consider the agenda approved. Next, we have general business and appearances. This is an opportunity for any member of the public to address the council on any topic that is not on tonight's agenda. And as with other uh, parts of the agenda, we ask you to keep your comments to uh, three minutes in length. Is there anyone in the room who wishes to be heard? Come on up. Lisa edson State Street. I'm here regarding the work happening around the residential properties flooded in 2023. What I am here asking for is a plan it's been more than a year. We're at a year and what, three or four months, and we still don't have a plan. And so what I'm asking for is a project plan for each property as needed, timelines, detailed milestones, who's responsible for each of those steps, and concretely identifying any steps that must occur to ensure elevations can actually begin in 2025. Because as we know, there are some steps that should have already happened and certainly need to happen immediately, or it will not even begin in 2025. Additionally, we're asking for an overall neighborhood plan. How is each property impacted? What does the watershed look like? What's the future use of each of the properties that are being changed? And finally, and just as importantly, clear, transparent communication. We do not get the same messages. Different homeowners get completely different messages. We get updates on individuals' properties that aren't ours, but that individual doesn't get those properties. We're willing to share the information that isn't the issue. We don't have communication. We're looking for updates on each project in one communication We'd really like to see it every two weeks. What's going on in each project every two weeks? And finally, forming work groups as needed. We just are begging to actually see things in writing so we can plan. Are we doing something this year? Are we doing something next year? How many more years are we going before we get to start? And it's amazing that after this many months, we still don't have that. And I keep asking for it. And so now I'd love to see this happen. Otherwise, if it's easier, if it's easier for me to come to each council meeting, I can come to each council meeting and we can do the updates here if that works better. 
Okay, thank you. Thanks. Yeah, I can respond to that because I appreciate. It. So we generally agree with that. I'm happy to provide regular updates. Uh, I can tell you where we're at right now. The state uh, did approve the money. The state's asked us for three documents. Two of them had been submitted. One, I don't know if they did get in today. No. So they're waiting for one last piece of information. Should be in today or tomorrow. I guess it'll be tomorrow at this point. Once that happens, we will get a subgrant agreement, which will out then outline for us what procurement process we can use in order to hire contractors. We just got that information from the state last week, what they needed from us. So we're turning around as quickly as we can, including information from our insurer. Once that happens, we can then procure engineers, contractors, all that kind of thing. We've already talked to some engineers that we think can do the job. We already talked to contractors that think it would be available in 2025, but we don't know from the state yet what that process will look like. So we can't tell you until we know. Uh, and again, we expect to know that sh shortly. Um, so we understand we've been pushing. Um, that's I'm trying to think what else was in there. Is, am I missing something? Mike? No. Um, yeah, so that's where we're at. We we can't tell you how we have to go about acquire. So there's you know states and things have procurement process, purchasing processes. We are hoping they will allow us to use our own, which means we can move faster. But we don't know that they haven't told us what it is yet. So once we do that, then we can then we can connect you with who's going to be doing the work, and we can do the plans. We understand that two of the properties in your neighborhood are, are eligible for um, elevation. One is going to be demolished. So that's what I know as of this afternoon. Um, so yes, all of that that you say makes sense. And once there is a project meeting regularly and communicating regularly about who's doing the work, when it's doing all that stuff will have to happen. But, but we we can't do we can't give you those timelines because we don't know what, you know, we can't do anything until the state tells us what our purchasing timelines are, what our process is. And this sort of highlights the problem in not having it written down with responsible parties because I contacted VEM and I, I CC'd people from the room and VEM then turns around and says, no, we're waiting on the city. Yep. We need a written plan, yep. not just for you all, but for us, yep. for those of us living in it. And we don't have that. And if what that says is we're on this stage, we're going to have to wait for VEM. Let's identify that so that we can hold them responsible. So you all get what you need to continue to move forward. But this is ridiculous yep. at this stage. And I, 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 I want to be clear. The first thing I said is they're waiting for one document from us. We just got this last week. They needed three documents from us including an insurance declaration and a statement of risk. We've got two of them in the statement of risk was being worked on, should be in by tomorrow morning. So they can't, they won't give us the subgrant agreement till they have those documents. So that is correct, that they are still waiting for one thing from us. We're on it. It's a high priority. So I, I don't want to make it sound like I'm saying, blaming VEM. I'm saying that they need that. Then they give us the subgrant agreement and then they give us the procurement process. Once we have that and we know what's allowed, then we can go forward and procure the services and then we'll, then we have an actual project and then we will be. So that's, I think you're getting accurate information. It's just, you know, it's what depends what day of the week it is, whether who's waiting for who. And you know what, I don't want to waste the council's time with a back and forth of giving a bunch of demonstrations on why we're not getting the same information. And just because you know what the timeline is, this is highlighting, this is what we should be getting every two weeks so we know what's going on, so we can plan. My understanding is that Ed just found out this morning that his project may be moving forward with lightning speed, at which point he needs to make plans around that. We are not getting this communication and we're not getting it timely. Okay, so I, I don't should, know anything about this project, but yes, fair you enough, should. and I agree with you. You should, thank you. Anyone else in the room? Steve. Uh, Steve Whitaker, Ron Pillar. Uh, garbage has not been emptied. Uh, we've never gotten the adequate number of cans back after the flood, and that seems to be... Uh, a simple thing to correct. Uh, I think there was wash cans that were left out of the stump dump. But now people are dumping garbage. I see today on the front of uh, the old lobster pot steps or Necky or the old Hugos. You know, bags of garbage just being discarded. Uh, it, the photo you're seeing there is four or five 
dog feces. And this is this is after the can has been emptied. I've raised this with the street supervisor uh, that his people need to be cleaning up around the cans when they empty the cans. But this is atrocious to have four or five bags of dog feces left around the surrounding the can while the can was emptied in the last few days. Um, the stairway uh, that floated away from Anna July, 18 months ago, 15 months ago, is still laying in Confluence Park East, uh, where the electric in that park. I spoke to water and sewer people when they were out there doing some work. Uh, it was going to be removed because it needs a big piece of equipment to lift it. No action months and months later. Um, there's an old street light from the lobster pot. The city acquired those properties to do the bike path. They left an old fluorescent street light there on a, pe a pedestal. It's buried in the tree, but you can. it needs to be removed. Now we've got a double pole because they just replaced the pole for these electric chargers. Uh, we still have not adopted the policy. I know, Jack, you agree that it's wise to ha require utilities working in the right of way to give prior notice to the city, because while the that street work was going on down School Street, Consolidated decided to park in the middle of state and Maine and do their work, simultaneously creating a huge cluster screw of traffic uh, and not enough laggers. Um, the double poles are both, there's right behind Abishans, one of them is on the Abishans land, but they're in a right of way easement that the city manages. The city needs to come down hard on getting those double poles removed. The sand on the bike path, the council was misled or lied to about whether that has been swept. There's no runoff drainage from Confluence Park that's redistributing the sand. The sand is a foot thick in Confluence Park. It hasn't been mowed, it hasn't been shoveled out, and it's been laying across the bike path. It has not been swept, and it's still there, a hazard to bicyclists who go around that corner on sand, it, and it's dangerous. Um, that's the shopping that's, cart that's, is still in the river. What is this, the third or fourth year? That's and, your three minutes. Yeah, I know you care about that shopping cart being in the river uh, three or four year, years after it's been called to your attention. So. Thank you. Any other members of the public wishing to? Oh, come on, Ed. <clears throat> At Hackett State Street. I'm wondering if uh, it's appropriate to ask if Josh can give us a quick update on buyouts. Do you have information, Josh? Um, I guess the only new information is is one buyout's been been approved. Um, kickoff meeting for that property. It's Mary's and Terrace property. 189 State Street. Um, I'm having a kickoff meeting with VEM on Friday. Um, that property was submitted through FEMA's SWIFT current program. The other two buyouts were submitted through FEMA's HMGP program, two different programs. Mary's was submitted through SWIFT current because she qualified for SWIFT current. It's a new program. So that's the extent of the updates. Okay, thanks. On more on Friday. Great, thanks. <clears throat> Anybody else in the room? Hey, Jack, just a, for, I forgot to mention, that dog poo is right in front of City Hall. That photo is right in front of City Hall. Thank you. Um, anybody online who uh, wishes to be recognized? I should have mentioned, it's, it's easy, the easiest for me if you operate the electronic hand signal on your screen okay i think that's the general business and appearances which brings us to the consent agenda is there a motion to approve the consent agenda so moved all right and this, all right it's been moved and seconded is there any discussion all those in favor signify by saying aye aye anyone opposed Okay, thank you. That brings us to, yes. Did Tim and Palin introduce themselves? Yes. Okay. <clears throat> what you saying? I thought we had to stop. Yep. Thanks. All right. 
Next up, uh, appointments to the Planning Commission. We have uh, four applications for four vacancies. I think, let me get back to that point on the agenda. Um, what's your pleasure, folks? Yes, Gary. Um, can we just confirm that there are four applications for four vacancies? Mike, do you do you know the answer to that? Uh, Mike Miller, Planning Director. I know there were three applicants. There are uh, four vacancies, but I believe there were three applicants that we've gotten so far. So I'm trying to go off go off memory. Um, so we had uh, three three seats that were coming up for renewal. And then we had um, Carlton that had stepped down. He has a year left on his. So there's one seat with one year left, three seats that are two year seats. Okay. And what I'm seeing from the cover sheet is there are four people, Maria Arsenlis. Yep. Um, Gabriel Lajanus, uh, Sean Linehan, and Leah Candland. Okay, so the first three are people who are already on the Planning Commission are looking for getting re-upped. And the fourth is the new person. Uh-huh. So you can... So it might make sense to appoint her to the unexpired remain, remaining year. Entirely up to you. Okay. All right. Is is there a motion? Well, yes, Lauren. Um, I move we appoint Maria Arsenlis, Gabrielle Lajunas, Sean Linehan to two year terms on the planning commission and Leah Candlin to a one year term on the planning commission. Is there a second? Okay. Any discussion? All those in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? Thanks. As always, thank you to everybody who uh, applies to volunteer for these jobs. Uh, next up, Country Club Road and Rec Update. Okay, can everybody hear me okay? I can. Great, okay. Oh, can't speak for everybody. Awesome. Um, so I am also monitoring the Zoom, just so everybody's aware, so I'm doing double duty here. Um, but just to introduce myself, uh, Kelly Murphy, Assistant City Manager, and I've got Mike Miller here, the um, Community Development Planning Director. Um, and so I'm going to just tee things up for this uh, conversation. It's kind of a, a two-part conversation um, focusing on the status of uh, recreation and housing at the Country Club Road site. Um, I just want to start with saying that um, we're not really looking for action tonight. We're really looking to get you information and provide status um, on these two particular items. On the call, I've got Alan Becker, who is with Power Wellness. He's going to be providing you with a brief uh, presentation of the findings from their study for the public process. Um, and so just getting on to a couple other details that I wanted to note based on what was in the council packet, um, because there, there's a lot in there. And so just to kind of sort it a little bit um, and just to provide context. Um, so the Country Club Road Actionable Master Plan calls for a recreation needs assessment um, for the recreation community zone. And so we tried to mirror what was done in that plan for this process. And so you'll hear a little bit about that in a few minutes. Um, and then Mike is going to provide you with an update on um, the housing components of that plan. Um, and so in terms of recreation, just to kind of level set, 
where we are um, in the packet. There were details provided um, from, if you can believe it, five years ago. Um, so December of 2019, when Bread Loaf, Loaf did a renovation study of the existing building. Um, so we provided you with those numbers along with um, an updated set of numbers. Uh, so you can kind of see what those renovations would look like. Um, so you'll get the report from Power Wellness um, and what, what they found, but I also wanted to give you a sense of what it would cost to um, renovate that building based on those plans. And so um, just to give a thumbnail sketch, uh, the original plans, the option two or upgraded version as presented by Bread Loaf would have been about 4.7 million. Um, and so if we took that forward in today's dollars, it would be about 7.6 million. Um, the other thing that I do want to note is that we are currently uh, working on some asbestos remediation within the building. Um, and so that is factored into both plans. Um, the new revised version, there's $95,000 for hazardous material uh, run, uh, remediation, excuse me. And then in the old plan, it called for 72,000, or actually it's the inverse. So it's 95 old plan, 72 new plan. Um, and so currently the city is in phase one of this remediation. Um, the total cost of that remediation is 55,000. Um, there will be a second phase, um, which should be complete within the next month or so. Um, and that final phase is um, working through uh, the the pipes. We've just completed the first phase, which is the, the boiler, boiler room. Um, and so the other thing that I want to note here is that um, we also have on the table a um, US DOA, DOE thermal energy storage grant for 1.2 million. There is a $300,000 city map, excuse me, city match to replace the heating and electrical service at the rec center. Um, so we're working on executing that grant agreement. Um, the asbestos work will be credited as part of the match. If the DOE grant is factored into the renovation of the recreation center, uh, we can anticipate that the cost would likely be updated from 7.6 to 6.8, which would be less the 531,000 for the upgraded HVAC and the 156,000 for the lighting and electrical. So that is a lot to kind of give you a, a sense of where we're at, but just to you know, if we were to renovate, um, we're looking at, you know, depending on what we do, the high end, probably 7.6, the lower end with the um, DOE grant factored in about 6.8. Um, and so with that, I'm going to turn it over to Power Wellness. They're going to provide an overview of um, where we stand with the assessment of the um, Country Club Road site. Can I just jump in? So thank you. Kelly really did hit it. But just to reiterate that um, the, the goal for tonight, particularly on the rec side, is for you to sort of be thinking about the different options to hear the presentation, ask questions. And then at, you know, a, a, an upcoming meeting very soon, then, you know, we're going to need some guidance of which where we should be pursuing. Um, but we thought rather than try to throw everything at you tonight and ask for a decision that you have a chance to absorb this, hear the information. Um, but we, you know, obviously we need to think about, are we going to be looking at the rec center on Barry Street? Are we going to be looking at Country Club Road? Are we going to be not doing anything? If if we look at Country Club Road, what are the choices there? Because there are a new number of options and proposals on the table that we would, you know, brief you on as we got going. So just wanted to set that as you're listening to Alan and you're asking questions, it's really with the goal of teeing us up for a a, a new conversation as soon as the next meeting to really start charting our course. So Alan, I can see that you're out there in Zoom land. And did you want to share your screen? No. And you're muted at this point, Alan. Okay, I'm unmuted. Um, I thought y'all were gonna uh, show the PowerPoint. So we certainly can do that. Um, I have okay. a lot for you to share your screen if you'd like, but if you would like us to share the PowerPoint, then you'll just need to, to give me a minute to do that. Okay. Is Actually, it okay? Uh, could I get the lights back, please? I'm sorry. Thank you. We'll take care of that, thank you. <clears throat> 
Just sit tight for a minute here. Okay, I think we are sharing the screen now. I'm going to minimize this. And Alan, if you want to take it away, go ahead. Sure. Um, thank you very much. We really appreciate uh, an opportunity to make this report to you today. Um, and the first thing I wanted to emphasize is that um, the, the purpose of our trip to Montpelier was not to do a feasibility study, but to determine if there was enough interest um, on the community's part in doing a feasibility study. Um, a feasibility study would obviously have a lot of data points in it. Uh, it would have a lot of demographic research behind it. And uh, the purpose of this trip was really more to get a sense of the mood of the community um, for us to take a look at existing uh, facilities and for us to base based on our experience to kind of um, tell you what we thought the possibilities were. And I just want to make sure can everybody understand me clearly? Yes, Kevin. Okay. Thank quick. you. Um, so these are really the, the major issues we kind of focused on in our two days of uh, meetings and discussions. Um, what the community support a new center? Um, is there a partner there uh, to participate in the development of the center? Where should the center be located? And are taxpayers willing to support this? Now, obviously, we're asking these questions. Um, they're kind of difficult questions to answer because we don't know what it is or what it's going to cost yet at this point. So when you ask somebody if they think a new recreation center is a good idea or you know, uh, remodeling and renovating the existing recreation center is a better idea, it's really hard for them to answer. Um, so we, um, this report is really more based on some opinions. We, we had a lot of uh, great participation in both the meetings we held in Montpelier and then the three uh, subsequent remote and virtual meetings um, that were held. Uh, we got some great feedback and it was great to, uh, to be able to visit there. Um, so on to the next slide. Um, what we did is we um, we reviewed the master plan that you had done and various studies that you had. Um, we held uh, focus groups. We toured uh, existing recreation facilities uh, with the rec recreation director, and then we had the three public meetings. And this is a gr uh, list of the groups that we uh, met with individually. Um, so there were a lot of people involved uh, and a lot of great um, input. And we got to tour all, I believe, of the existing uh, city facilities. So now let's go to the next slide and talk a little bit about um, what we heard. And again, this is not based on hard scientific data, though there is a survey that uh, was conducted that has some very interesting results. Um, there was definitely uh, almost, I would say, unanimous support from the people we met with in those focus groups that there needed to be something larger and newer. The, the existing recreation center is simply too small. Um, it, it's impossible for it to house um, many more services than it does today. It's not an ideal um uh, facility, and therefore investing seven or eight million dollars in it 
uh, might not be the, the best long-term decision. We also had a lot of people who talked about how Montpelier really needed, um, other than being a wonderful city to live in and in a beautiful place with a, you know, a great downtown, there needed to be other reasons to attract the people uh, to the community. And this was particularly felt by the hospital uh, and the difficulty it's had in recruiting physicians. Now, of course, recruiting physicians to small communities is a problem all over the country. It's not a problem that is particular to Montpelier. Uh, physicians tend to want to practice in larger communities um, for the good reason of that it's easier for them to get back up and to have share people to share call with. And that's just a reality of a small community. But Montpelier does have a lot of very positives. Um, and so if we don't invest in a new uh, facility, we're gonna kind of fall behind our neighbors who are investing in those facilities. Montpelier has a, a very a long and, and deep winter. And so that, you know, creates the requirement for more indoor facilities. But there was a lot of um, opinion that getting an agreement on funding is going to be difficult, particularly when we don't know what that number is. And particularly because a number was thrown out um, by a previous consultant that was uh, probably unrealistic and that, that shocked a lot of people. Um, so next slide. Um, these are some kind of, so, let's say, softer um, thoughts that we heard from a lot of people. And there's obviously, you know, multiple sides to this equation, uh, which makes it algebra, and I'm not good at algebra. Um, but, you know, Montpelier is a walking community, so the fact that the recreation center um, is walkable for certain people is a great benefit. Uh, there was also a lot of concern that if we're going to be investing money in any, any place, we need to be investing money in rebuilding our infrastructure uh, because of what we went through with the flood. Um, people aren't going to want to raise taxes because they were already too high. And, um, on the, you know, on, and, you know, people don't want to have to use their cars. So they're going to be people that are resistant about going to the country club site. On the other side of the equation, um, that is considered to be something that would bring more people to town if we had a new recreation facility on the country club road site. Um, there is an extremely um, active and vocal group, the hub group, uh, we talked with them several times. They have a serious and um, I think well-intentioned desire to get involved and to develop certainly racket sports. Um, and there needs to be more conversations about that because it's very hard since we don't know what any of this is going to cost to, you know, get agreement on you know, is this a reasonable price? Because we don't know what the price is. So right now it's kind of pie in the sky. Um, so next, um, the slide, um, there was an online survey conducted by the city, which um, I think was great. It got a lot of respond responses, um, you know, uh, and it really, I think it was very consistent with what we heard in the focus groups. If it had been inconsistent with what we heard in the focus groups, we'd be a little worried, but it wasn't. Um, I think it was uh, very um, consistent. People wanted this facility to be centrally located um, to the, you know, uh, point that it can be centrally located. And um, people were interested in the same things that we see people interested in most of the communities that we work in. And we work all over the country. And we work in a lot of very small communities and a lot much smaller than Montpelier. Everybody wants an indoor pool. Um, indoor pools are great. 
Uh, people want a uh, walking or running track and they want space for fitness and group exercise classes. And they want um, a focus on nutrition because, you know, we have restaurants advertising things that we all enjoy, but no, maybe we shouldn't eat as much of. And uh, one of the things that a recreation center can do is help to send out a different message uh, about nutrition. And if we go to um, the second page, um, the, or rather the next page of the survey, um, we have some really interesting graphics here. Um, and you can see that an indoor swimming pool, which everyone loves an indoor swimming pool, was the thing that most people mentioned, um, followed by walking tracks. Now, in some communities, you wouldn't have walking tracks is the second choice but given the nature of the way montpelier is laid out in the beautiful paths that you have and the you know the new paths that you have on the country club road site and the fact that people are very outdoorsy they like um, things they can do in the winter as well as the summer uh, i think the walking tracks trails as a second choice makes a lot of sense um, uh, a workout gym room was mentioned by a lot of people was very important. Child care, very important. Um, and, uh, and then when you look at the circles, uh, you know, how do you self see yourself being involved with the services at a center? Um, you know, mostly people are interested in participating and bringing their children there. I think those numbers line up with what we see in most communities. Um, and um, the the same thing for question 11, the weighted average there, 7.62. This again is in line with, with you know, what we, we see in other communities, both large and small. Um, people want pools. Um, obviously pools are very expensive. They're the most expensive, you know, thing to put in a recreation center. And you have to look at those things, um, really closely. Um, the, the walking paths, um, and hiking is something that's very inexpensive to, to develop. And the fact that the community is really focused on that is a nice thing and, and I think will draw a lot of people to these facilities. So now if we go on to, I think, uh, the last page in our deck, um, you know, we have been um, developing community recreation, fitness and wellness facilities for 27 years. Uh, we're the largest operator of these types of facilities uh, in the country. And so um, you hired us because I think to some extent you wanted to hear our opinion after we visited Montpelier. And uh, our opinions are pretty clear. Um, and uh, I know there may be people that disagree with them. I think some of these will require more of a proper kind of formal feasibility process. Um, but, you know, the first thing that became obvious to us is that Berry Street is not um, a, a good long term option. Berry Street doesn't do anything well. Um, it barely provides basketball well, um, and the community deserves uh, better basketball facilities than that. Um, we know that people are, love the walkability of Montpelier. They love the attractiveness of downtown, uh, but there is no location downtown that's suitable for developing a recreation center, which will appeal to the wider community. There's no parking, there's no land available. Um, it, it's a it's a nice thing to think about, but we don't think the long term it's the right solution for the community. Uh, on the other hand, uh, you know we've we've done a, a more than a hundred of these studies. As I mentioned, we have worked all over the country from Arizona to Wyoming to California. Um, we were our breath was taken away when we saw the site on Country Club Road. It, it is absolutely beautiful. 
Um, I know a long line of people that wish they had a, a, a piece of land like that as close to their community as you do. And I think it gives you a lot of options for the future. Um, we also were kind of surprised by the condition of the building, of the Elks Lodge building. Um, from the outside, it's as ugly a building as I've ever seen. But once you get past the exterior and get into the building, every room is kind of a surprise of another opportunity that's presented. The fact that there was already childcare there and there's, you know, the little toilets for the children. There is a portion of the building that actually has a very tall ceiling that used to be a ballroom. The building is in pretty good structural condition. Um, it presents a lot of opportunities. Yes, it needs a facelift um, and it needs some uh, improvements in the wayfinding, which will probably happen with an exterior hallway. Um, you probably can't fix it through the interior, but that building is, a, is an asset that needs to be uh, explored in more depth. Uh, we think that you could add on to that building. Um, we would obviously you would add on if you wanted to do racket sports or another basketball court, you could add on in a modular fashion. You could start with the building that's there, do this in phases so that you're not faced with a 30 or $40 million um, thing you have to bite off all at once. Um, and finally, we think there should be some discussions with the hub group about some type of public-private partnership and see what uh, financing options they have available and how the city and the hub group might work together. Um, so that's those are our opinions as um, succinct and as clear as uh, we can deliver them. Um, we think that for next steps, um, what you might consider, and this is on the next slide, is, um, uh, and the slide below this, is that you do uh, consider doing a real feasibility process where you do look at the demographics, you look at what people are willing to pay, what they can pay. Um, from that, you develop a preliminary space program. And very importantly, we have to look at what the communities willingness is to invest money. Um, and that has to be on the table because it would make no sense to do a feasibility study and come back and say, you know, spend $20 million when the fact is you simply can't afford it. Um, we wanna make sure that we understand when we start this process, what's the reasonable range of money that might be available and when might that money be available so we can talk about phasing this in over time rather than looking at a hu one huge big project that will uh, frighten and, and scare a lot of people. And we do our feasibility studies in two phases. We do an initial phase and then we do a second phase. So you don't have to commit to as much of an expense um, when we start and if we get through the first half and it doesn't look like it's possible, then uh, we say it's not possible from a business case perspective. And um, let's, you know, call it a day at that point. Um, so that is, that is our report. Um, and I know there may be questions. I'm not exactly sure how you want to do this, but I am available to uh, listen in and answer any other questions that there may be. Great, thank you. Thank you, Bill. Let's start with the folks here on the council and see what questions people or thoughts people might have. Yeah, Adrian, go ahead. Um, thank you so much for that presentation. It was um, informative and um, I did attend one of your focus groups. So, and I know that, um, you know, people had really good comments and feedback, but what I'd like to learn a little bit more about your experience in the hundred studies that you have done across the country is I'd like to learn more about how these communities have funded these projects 
and different funding models. I mean, we talk about private public partnerships, but have what other creative ways and incentives and regional partnerships that might you have seen to fund these types of activities? Well, the majority uh, of funding mechanisms is through some kind of bond issuance. Um, uh, you know, the traditional way that you would fund uh, road construction or any other new project. Um, the we do see um, this the second funding mechanism are local healthcare foundations. Um, some those are more of a rarity, but sometimes they exist. Uh, we did a project in Winter Park, Florida, using a foundation's money. Um, they were interested in wellness, and they thought this was the best way to do it. Um, uh, public private partnerships are much more complicated. Um, and they take a longer period to negotiate up front. Um, and obviously, a public-private partnership is a partnership where uh, the public allows a private individual to use their land or a facility that they have. And um, tax revenues or membership dues pay the private party back. Um, that's how the financing works. It is complicated to arrange, but there are certain cases where it works or where the conversation around public-private partnerships might lead to a, um, a different arrangement that's more of like a traditional foundation arrangement um, or somebody agrees to subsidize something for a certain period, a uh, number of years. I think it's important to know that this is not a business that has much of a return on investment. Um, is, it, is the nature of all public improvements, we do them because we think they're good for the community. And when um, we see a private investor that wants to do one of these things for a return, um, we usually are, are not... Um, we don't recommend those situations because, you know, the for-profit gyms, they make their money on financing. Well, a city is not going to do that. You're not going to hold people to membership contracts and go after them because they don't pay their dues. Um, so that that's kind of what we see. But most of it is is tax exempt uh, funding. I just have a, a follow up question. Um, so you ha you did say that you have worked in communities similar to the size of Montpelier, and um, you know a bond is expensive. And one of your results of your um, analysis and what we've heard for many years in Montpelier that we just don't have the appetite to pay for for something like this. And so I'm wondering, have you ever seen a successful um, like? regional partnerships with other towns to invest in recreation, more of a regional level rather than based at a city level? One, the regional facilities that we've seen are usually dedicated to one sport, um, such as tennis or baseball uh, or swimming. And when you do something like that, um, it's possible to get regions to come together. The difficulty you're going to have here is that um, generally people won't drive more than 15 or 20 minutes to work out. Uh, so you have to have enough base of support within a, you know, at the far end, 20 minute drive time for a, a kind of general purpose recreation center. And if you're going to create a regional facility, then let's say a regional basketball facility, and I believe there is one um, in in your region. You have to have multiple courts so you can hold you can hold uh, tournaments. So um, you know, or baseball fields, you've got to have four baseball fields. You've got to have multiple soccer fields. And so one of the things we would do in a feasibility study is to talk to um, the neighboring communities and see if that opportunity exists. Um, I, I, we didn't hear in our focus groups that there was necessarily an opportunity like that. Um, but maybe we weren't listening 
uh, as hard as we should have been, and maybe there is one. Um, maybe it exists in the case of tennis or soccer. Um, in, in, uh, is, in terms of size, a community, one of our most successful centers is in a community, uh, I think population of about 8,000. Um, and we're currently developing a facility in a town in Oklahoma that has a population of less than 2,500. Um, it's a relatively poor community in the southeastern portion of Oklahoma. And we've actually brought um, in, rather, I shouldn't say we brought in, but uh, the Choctaw Nation um, came up and offered to help. And because of their help and involvement and their guarantee of a certain amount of the cost of the facility, it will become a possibility for the community and for the Eastern Oklahoma State College. So there are a lot of a lot of different ways to approach these things. Um, thanks, Sal. I think you said your hand. Yeah, one of the things I was hoping for out of this report was because uh, I know you you uh, also spoke with the folks at um, the hospital, um, and uh, it seemed to me I, there, there was a portion of the report that that included um, some some. Um, conclusions from your discussions with with the hospital but was there any was there any sense that um a a potential uh, partnership or some sort of uh investment structure w was possible with that organization it's it seemed the only conclusion that i definitive conclusion that i saw was that they seemed to think that that housing was was a top priority and recreation was secondary um, that's a that, uh, that's a good uh, observation. Um, our meetings with the hospital were of people that worked at a lower level. Uh, we did not meet with a member of the senior management team, uh, as I recall. And the, so the, the hospital did have a list of the things they were interested in, which they gave us or we took in the meeting, which are all things that made sense. Um, I, I think one of the things we would need to do is to arrange for a meeting with the uh, CEO and chief operating officer of the hospital and maybe the uh, system people and explain to them in a little more detail what this what the possibilities are of doing this, because I think they would be interested in participating uh, at a higher level. Housing is a big issue for them, again, because of the physician recruitment um, and probably senior staff recruitment issue. But I, I think uh, we did, we are a little, um, did not get as much information from the hospitals we would like, and we'd like to spend more time with them because we think they should, would be a lot more supportive as hospitals have been in other communities. The one thing the hospital is probably concerned about is and would probably be hesitant to state would be what their level of financial support would be because hospitals all over the country right now with very few exceptions are operating at near zero to one percent margins and they're not sure what's going to happen to them in the next fiscal year and so they're very concerned now about spending money on capital or, or you know, leasing spaces because, you know, you, in the hospital business, you never know who's going to walk in the door the next day. And what more, and even worse, you don't know what they're going to pay for the care you give them. So margins are very uh, kind of nerve wracking right now for everybody in the hospital business. Yeah, th thank you for that. I appreciate your comments on the uh, hospitals. Uh, misgivings about funding. I know they're all under a, a, lot of, a lot of pressure lately. They are. They are. Anyone else up here? At, uh, uh, Tim. Sorry, I mute. Um, yeah, thanks. Thanks for the presentation. It was uh, very interesting, and I was glad to hear you talk about the private-public partnership piece more in your presentation. It was certainly more than I got out of the written piece, so 
glad to hear that. I, I think Tim, could you try yeah. to? Oh, okay. No, not... I think we're good now. Okay. So I, I think the only piece I would say is that the kind of your last line in in the report um, is probably a, a good place for us to start. And it, basically, just read it briefly. It, it says concurrent with the study, an analysis must be completed that estimates the city's capital capabilities. And this analysis should also include both a long-term and short-term master plan to establish the amount of available funding for recreation. So I think that is a big challenge before this council and, and this budget comes up. I, I really think it's a place we need to start out uh, before go going too much into detail on, on our recreation plans. I mean, I agree with that. Um, it's you know, we were making trade-offs here and, um, you know, a recreation is, uh, at this point is you, if you develop new facilities is very much a focus on the future and deciding how much money to spend on the future versus how much money you need to spend repairing things or reconditioning things that are damaged is a, that's it's a really difficult um, decision to make, um, and you know it's it's a choice that people have to make. And in our mind, of course, we're kind of always focused on the future. How can we improve communities? How can we improve people's health? And um, we think it's a worthwhile pursuit. Um, but we can't uh, we can't be totally objective about that because that's our business. Thanks. Um, any other questions? Uh, Adrian. Question. Yeah. This is another follow up question. So um, it sounds like your focus, obviously, power wellness is is you know finding partnerships with healthcare organizations. Have you had success in finding partnerships with? organizations that aren't particularly like, you know, hospitals or insurance companies, like, you know, we have, I found, we have a list of like 10 pretty large employers in central Vermont that range from cheese to coffee, to socks, to insurance. Like, um, you know, have you partnered with organizations like that for funding to offset city cost um, that goes beyond a healthcare organization? Yes, we have. And it, it's interesting, in the last um, couple of years, um, more most of our new facilities have been developed with communities. They haven't been developed with hospitals. Um, and we see the uh, our growth market as being more the community recreation facility. And there's a number of reasons for that. Um, and uh, one of the reasons is that hospitals are becoming increasingly complicated to work with. Um, and, uh, you know, sometimes if you get a hospital involved in an organization, it can slow things down. Um, and recreation centers in and of themselves are not really very complicated facilities. Um, uh, and it, it's interesting that we uh, we just took over the management of two community recreation facilities um, in the last two years where the, the cities knew that they weren't really in a great position to manage them because they are retail businesses. Um, and that's the same problem for hospitals. So in a recreation facility, you're only as good as the experience that your last customer had, whether they were swimming, playing basketball, working out with weights. Um, we go to the hospital and we're not sure that we had a good experience. If we're alive, we had a good experience, um, but we don't really know because we're not in a position to judge doctors in the way they or nurses in the way they interact with us. So certainly we hope they're pleasant. Uh, and nurturing, but we don't know what the quality is of what they did because we're not in the medical field. With uh, community recreation facilities, it's there's a constant feedback, uh, and you're also it's also a retail thing. You want somebody to join, 
uh, and to be a member. And so you have to please them. And for cities, it's sometimes hard to manage those and we've become a specialist in it. So we are doing a lot more with um, facilities. We also currently manage a facility for an insurance company in upstate New York and Albany. Um, and that insurance company is very focused on wellness. And um, they said, we want this for our members and we're going to offer our members discounts if they go there and work out. Um, and which may be the future for a lot of insurance companies. So uh, we would definitely want to talk to the large employers and figure out how to get them involved. And one way to get them involved is for them to commit to a certain number of memberships for a certain period of time. And that helps to build the base of the number of members we need to justify the expense of remodeling or building a recreation facility. Thanks, Sal. Just, uh, just one more question. Um, I know your visit was um, was brief and, and it was interrupted and had to be rescheduled and so on. So I'm not sure you had time for everything you'd hoped for, but I wonder if when you were evaluating the existing recreation building on Barry Street, if you uh, were able to review the report from uh, GBA, the architects, the most recent report, Gazin's Bachman uh, Architects, did you yes, see that we, report? We, yeah, we did review that report. We saw what their plans were for uh, abating the asbestos, um, for making the building handicap accessible, for updating the mechanical systems. Uh, we did see that report. I mean, they did a great job, um, but at the end of the day, uh, there there's no space to expand the building. There are limit, limitations on the building. And... Um, you know, uh, we feel strongly to the point that if you, before we spent $8 million on that building, we'd look at how far you could get with $8 million on Country Club Road. Yeah, no, That's, thank you. I just wanted to make sure you had that, had that in yes, your judgment. Yeah. And we thought the master plan that was done for Country Club Road, if I didn't mention it before, also was a terrific master plan. And the idea of getting housing up there is a great idea. Um, and I think, um, you know, it would be beneficial to the community. Thanks. Any question, other questions from members of the council before I open it up to the public? Okay, anyone in the room who'd like to be uh, have any questions or comments? Steve, go ahead. Yeah, I'm speaking both to the Country Club Road update and the thing. I think we're, uh, it's good to gather information, but he's, the presenter on from Power Wellness has made clear that we're a long way from a business plan or a feasibility study. And so I want to call your attention back to the, uh, and I can provide a transcript if you like, of the uh, June 28th meeting of 2023, wherein there was a lot of discussion about Country Club Road saying, we want to be more involved. We need to be more involved. We don't want this happening, you know, behind our back and coming to us with a fait accompli. The council uh, directed and the city manager agreed that there would be a full workshop dedicated to uh, that in August. Unfortunately, a flood intervened. Uh, and the entire uh, framework and direction that you were pursuing has been hijacked here. So I want to call your attention to pages 24 to 30 of what, what's called the actual plan or the was also referred to as a conceptual working draft. In fact, the city's website refers to it as a uh, concept plan, an illustrative concept plan. It is not a master plan. It is not an actionable plan. It's a concept and it has not been adopted by the council. So, but recommended next steps on in chapter 10 of that document was to convene a working group for recreation and community zone. That's not a consultant. That's a local working group of people an Abnaki working group, a housing needs assessment, an uh, archeological assessment, a permit assessment, a mobility working group, a railroad crossing com conversation, uh, secondary access. There's a long list of due diligence 
none of which has been done since that time in June of 23. So I think if you look at that six or eight pages, you'll realize how far off the rails we have run. And what is being done is a drive to uh, outrun Act 250 jurisdiction. The Growth Center document was so grossly incomplete and in effect a, a fraud upon the Regional Planning Commission, it's several members of which took, a, took exception last night at their meeting saying, wait a minute, you're taking away our prerogative of approval and, and integration and uh, written findings of how it relates to a regional plan. So they're going to have to deal with that uh, in the concept. But my point is, look at pages 24 to 30 of the ac actual actionable working draft plan and direct that the city manager and planning director correct the website. It was not adopted. It is not a it is not the direction we are moving. We've got a whole lot more due diligence of ag soils, of hydrogeology, of wetlands, of et cetera, before we're ready to decide how recreation and housing are gonna potentially compete with each other here. So I just wanna sober the conversation back to the work we have done and get you back on course. I'm happy to make a transcript of that August 28th meeting or that section of it available. And I think it, it would be due diligence for y'all to read it. Thank you. Anybody else in the room or online who'd like to address this? Evening. Hello, Alan. Thanks. It's good to see you again, Nat Winthrop. I'm a vice chair of the hub. Um, and uh, I just wanted to apprise the council members who may not be aware that uh, the hub in coordination with Steve Ribellini uh, presented a formal offer to Bill Frazier back in late April of this year to purchase the clubhouse building for a price of $750,000, a quarter of the price that the city paid for that, the whole property with 134 acres, um, plus a swap or purchase of three to five acres uh, more or less contiguous to that building to the east. Um, Bill Frazier replied that he would need to wait for the power wellness uh, report, including public input, before giving us an answer or presenting the offer to the council. So now, or very soon, is that time and we intend to present a formal proposal to the council at your next meeting on October 23rd. Now, um, my colleague John Rahill will present uh, just a brief history of our ongoing discussions with the city, which dates back a full three years. John Rahill, uh, architect with Black River Design, but more importantly, a tennis player trying to stay young. Um, ironically, three years from when we started this conversation, um, we just heard that uh, where we have one court left, that by July next year, we will have no courts in Central Vermont. The Green Mountain Community Fitness is taking over the last one. So I thought a little history was useful just because we, we're sort of arriving at an exciting spot where uh, the consistency of uh, initial thoughts and the power wellness report, I think, are worth uh, recounting. Um, three years ago, we needed a place because we we knew the courts were being reduced. 
and we, we couldn't find a building around. And uh, we, I knew Steve Ribellini and I said, Steve, how would you feel about putting another building on your site next to golf? We thought maybe golf is summer. We could mostly winter. Wouldn't that be nice? We could share locker rooms. He said, yeah, we could do that. And um, we presented our initial idea, uh, which included some community space. Uh, we knew that, that, that uh, there were things that would make the tennis, uh, the racket sports uh, more viable. Uh, and as a courtesy, we presented that to the, the city and they got excited about it. Uh, they were planning either something at the rec field or I mean, at the rec center or maybe something down at the uh, uh, by the tennis courts by the rec field and presented a couple of weeks later after we talked about uh, joining forces uh, up there. They presented to, to some of you were still here then three years ago, uh, the three directions and you they, they got direction from you to sort of pursue the country club site. Um, we talked about the, the city introduced the concept of the public private partnership and we said, sure, you know, we, we can get you grants, we, we can help staff, uh, we need a daycare, you, you're saying you need a daycare. We were planning tennis, uh, we don't wanna duplicate services, we should be cooperating and we got pretty excited about it. And um, when the city went and uh, proposed to buy the property, uh, we said, well, we should support this. And we worked very hard to support the bond. Um, and that was some time ago. Uh, we understand the city had to do some due diligence and planning. And uh, we're delighted that that uh, White and uh, Burke planning process ended up sort of confirming that uh, it's a great site for recreation. Uh, this, they designated a spot that makes sense for recreation, and it's certainly not exclusive of housing. So it's a beautiful site that's big enough for all kinds of stuff. Um, our excitement was partially because there's an existing restaurant there. We were going to share locker rooms. And the theory is that putting one building all by itself doesn't have the capability of having a family go and have one kid playing soccer and another kid uh, in daycare. So the notion of having a site that's big enough to have multiple uh, activities was, was really made a lot of sense. Um, so we adjusted our plan actually and said, well, if we put a tennis building here, um, we could leave another spot for whatever the city needed here, knowing that the city might <coughs> take longer to uh, put, pull something together. Uh, so it, it's, it felt very good, and we were delighted after the report that uh, it all seemed to make sense and it seemed to be uh, those uses would coexist. Um, we had a great meeting with Power Wellness and, and we were delighted that somebody familiar with the notion of uh, public-private uh, can work. We're, we're in, the hub wouldn't really be private. It's really public nonprofit. Uh, in case people were worried about, you know, somebody getting rich on tennis. Uh, so um, we, we're at a place now where we're desperate for moving ahead. And after three years, we hope that uh, we can in the next couple of weeks present uh, a plan that really saves the taxpayers of Montpelier from having to wrestle with an expenditure that when we know there's a few other things on the on the table and uh, look forward to coordinating just as we were talking about doing three years ago. We think that our recreation goals align very nicely and look forward to that conversation and, and our proposal. And I'm happy to answer any questions that I've missed uh, talking about. Great, thanks. Um, Phil. And you are unmuted now. Okay, great. Um, my name is Phil Dodd. Uh, just to be clear, I'm not going to be writing about this topic for the bridge, but I did want to share some thoughts about the rec project. Um, I actually don't agree with the conclusion that we should renovate the Elks uh, Lodge and put in fitness and child care facilities there. I think renovating the current rec center makes more sense. It's walkable for kids, and we need a basketball and pickleball facility. Uh, right now the renovation costs of 7.5 or i guess actually 6.8 million 
is not cheap, but ultimately much less than building multiple basketball courts and a track at Country Club. Uh, I'd also note Breadloaf initially presented three estimates. Uh, this update is just of the, the middle-priced one. Uh, so using some of the cheaper costs, you might be able to even get a, another million dollars lower than the 6.8. Um, as an aside, I would note that Breadloaf's estimate has gone up 60% in five years, which just shows why it is so hard to build anything today, including housing. Um, I attended or watched all three public hearings held by Power Wellness. Uh, it seemed to me maybe half the people speaking were opposed to a new rec center up there and preferred having it downtown. Um, there is one piece of land that might be available downtown, the RK Miles site, but building a new rec center there would be costly too. I even question the need for Montpelier to build a fitness facility, meaning a weight room and exercise room. Uh, we already have Green Mountain Fitness nearby. The price to join Planet Fitness is very reasonable. I just checked it would cost about $180 a year to join there. Uh, the estimate in the Ballard and King study was that an adult would need to pay $450 a year to use a new rec center without a pool. And that study did not include the cost of building a new $44 million center. I guess I question whether voters would approve a big bond for a new rec center when we have so many other municipal capital needs. Uh, not to mention the recent report to the school board suggesting we build a new high school for $110 million. Uh, by contrast, working with a hub uh, may be a more reasonably priced uh, way to at least get some tennis facilities up there. Uh, I'm not sure we need any further study of these options. We've had the Ballard and King survey in 2019, then their study of the operational costs of a new rec center, and now we have this report. I think the council knows enough at this point to make a decision on its own. Um, I just want to finish by pointing to what Tim Heaney brought up, that paragraph that said the city really needs to have a, a look at its capital master plan. And it would be helpful to understand all the possible bonds we might uh, be considering or choosing between in the next few years, whether it's Country Club Road, Isabel Circle, water pipe replacement, wastewater plant, uh, and work like replacing the pipes and repaving East State Street and North Street. Um, I see that the city's bond policy is on the agenda for October 23rd, and I just wanted to ask Bill, is it is it possible we can see a capital master plan by then, or, or does such a thing exist? Uh, first of all, the debt policy will be later than that. It won't be ready for the next meeting. Uh, capital plan, probably the f we're shooting for the following meeting, November 13th, but, we, but I just made a note to sort of for us to sketch out what bonds that we're thinking might be in the pipeline. So okay. That, That'd be helpful. We'll talk more about that later. Thank you. Thanks, Phil. Anybody else in the room or online? Jack, can I offer 30 seconds since you mentioned the capital plan? Uh, yes, 30 the, seconds. The requirement uh, in statute for the growth center expansion requires a capital plan to have already incorporated the costs of roads, sidewalks, water, sewer, et cetera, for the expanded growth center, meaning the country club road property. So that's how deficient our application was as but one example. Thank you. Okay, are we ready to move on to the next phase of this conversation? Alan, thank you for that. Thank you. All right, so Mike Miller, planning director. So um, this isn't, again, not a, a large presentation, just another update because we were already having a conversation on Country Club Road. made sense to sit back down um, uh, and talk about, you know, we had talked this year in this fiscal year, we kind of had three uh, three major milestones and a fourth set of, of things going on. So the first was to do the zoning changes, which we did. We got those done and adopted. Uh, the next was to do the growth center designation. That application was submitted in June. Uh, we received some comments back and amended the application slightly in August based on the comments of the staff and uh, it was approved in September. And our understanding uh, based on the information that uh, Steve had sent, Steve Whitaker had sent to the board, they're reviewing with their attorneys what's, you know, 
they're doing their due diligence and they're going to get back to us. If there are any requirements that we need to do, obviously we'll go and do them. But as far as we've heard, um, we haven't heard anything, uh, but we'll, we're waiting to see what they're doing. They're the, they're the experts. They're the ones who know the law. They've got attorneys on staff that look at these things. So uh, again, uh, the way the process works for growth centers, we're given an application. We fill out the application. Uh, I don't go and read the statutes to double check to see whether our uh, state government is <laughs> following state statutes. We fill out the applications. We submit the application. Um, there's nothing nothing underhanded coming out of my office. We're simply filling out the application, sending it in. They do their staff reviews. They send us comments, ask for additional evidence, which we did. Uh, the one change that uh, was requested before the, the meeting in September, which we discussed in, uh, uh, Bill and I discussed earlier in September, which was that uh, they would only be able to approve, um, we had talked about adding in areas of residential 9,000 zoning districts. And according to, to statute, only areas that have sidewalks or who have sidewalks in our capital budget would be eligible to be put in. And so those areas that do not have sidewalks at this time are not in the uh, growth center that was approved in September. So uh, we will be getting those draft maps put together so the public can have access to see what, what properties went in and what properties did not go in. But um, that was good news for some projects, um, you know, in particular, like the, the Northfield Street, um, Habitat for Humanity will likely be a property that will now be in the growth center. So we'll have a couple of those, but we'll get those out to you when that's ready. So that, but we don't have anything final yet. No written decision has been given to us. We don't have any written findings. Um, so we just had the the oral approval at that time and we'll see uh, at what time we get the actual written documents and whatever uh, additional information they request. Um, so that was the second step. The third step we've talked about is tax increment financing. Um, we kind of stacked these as we did because we couldn't do the growth center application without the zoning amendment. We can't do the TIF without, well, we said we can't do the, the TIF without the growth center. Not entirely true. Uh, we can do the TIF without the growth center. It's just a larger application. It's a much uh, quicker application. So that was why we were stacking them the way we did. Um, it wouldn't have mattered because White and Burke is, hasn't been available. They've been uh, rather busy. Their schedule is opening up. They are going to be sending us a contract, which we'll get in front of you in November. So you guys can review the contract about hiring White and Burke to put together uh, a TIF application. Uh, and then the final piece is the due diligence pieces. And these uh, actually reflect a lot of the comments Steve was just mentioning from those pages. Uh, we talked to White and Burke about what would be the next steps. We've al also been talking to other developers uh, about their processes and what should be the next steps. So you have a list in, in the packet of the different steps that we are undertaking right now. If you've got any specific questions, I won't go through bullet by bullet what we're, what we're doing, but there are due diligence steps that we are working on uh, right now uh, that will be going on into next year. So that's our, our plan for the rest of this fiscal year as it comes to Country Club Road are to do um, this due diligence and the TIF application. And what is a reasonable expectation for getting approval of the uh, TIF district? Uh, I believe they laid out a, a timeline. Um, it's There's a lot of factors that go into it. It's not just putting together the application. There's also requirements in windows. Uh, if you if the, if the council approves it before a certain time, then it ends up in one year. And so there's specific times that they've got in their work plan, but it would, it would happen next year in the, I think, I believe in the later, later spring. Okay. I, I think, think it had to be after April 1st, had to right. be when there were, if there was any vote, it would have to be after April 1st or else it ends up in this year and then everything gets messed up. Uh -huh. Because and when we're talking about this year, we're talking about the um, this base year. level of tax level. So after April 1st, you're in a new tax year. So they'll, we're, I sort of think with this special name, they call it, but 
Uh, so when you're setting a TIF district and you're setting the base tax level, you want it at your most current grand list as possible. Um, so it would be after that. I think the plan is that between now and then, uh, we'll finish up whatever needs to happen with the growth center. If the state needs any more information, um, get the TIF work going. That takes a little while. Finish the engineering, finish uh, the, the punch list so that by spring-ish, we're ready to go. We've got everything completed. We've got the entryway design. We've got a TIF district. And then that's when you all had then directed us to seek um, development partner. Then presumably they'd spend, you know, half of next year laying out what they want to do so that we would be ready to start building and hopefully spring of 26 or right? in mm -hmm. 26. I think that that time, those charts with with the times, dates, the numbers and everything were one of the things that I was thinking about when I was at my eye doctor yesterday. I was telling, you know, having a hard time reading some really small print. <laughs> so that, I think that was it. should be able to expand. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah, the, I mean, the, the goal would be that if there if we were going to have a bond vote, it would be a we would have we try to have it be in the March 26. So that way it's in there. Uh -huh. So that way. OK, because we can't get into 25. There's nothing in 25 other than March, March and we obviously wouldn't be ready for that. So. Yeah. Any other uh, Gary? Yeah, I'm, I'm looking at the timeline that is included here. Uh, OK. And it's it's looking a little later. I don't know if adjustments were made after you made this, but on here it has a bond vote happening in twenty seven and building happening in twenty eight. Yeah, Josh, Josh and I looked at that. Sorry, we should have we should have checked to make sure that the updated one got into the packet. Okay. It, it was Great. yeah. When we look at that, we were like, that's that doesn't fit into the the timeline that we had discussed with them and i don't know if that was just an um, an error on their part or if there was a reason they had it there but we don't see why there shouldn't be any reason why um 26 wouldn't work okay anybody else um and tim and palin i don't see your hands up so uh all right. Any other questions from members of the public? I think we're close to the end of this discussion. I just uh, asked a question. <laughs> Mike, um, I'm just uh, wondering about this, the scale of operations that we're thinking about. Um, you know, I was reading the other day that Vermont needs at least 24,000 houses, like, you know, tomorrow. We're not going to provide them, obviously, but... <laughs> Are the developers that we're talking to able to do things at scale? Yeah, that's our intention. That's why the that's why we did the Whitenburg plan was for us to kind of get an understanding of what the community would be interested in, what would be acceptable to the community. And that discussion came out and found that that lower area of the country club um, people supported high density housing, so up to five stories in height. So that that could fit a couple hundred units in there. Um, and obviously then you'd have lower densities higher up. We could fit, and that and that assumed there would be no housing within the recreation zone. Uh, there's always possibility that you could co-locate both a community facility and housing in the same building. Uh, so but, you're thinking rental units, not, not single family? Um, that was the direction that the public gave. Detached. The public actually gave very clear message that they didn't want single family detached housing mm -hmm. at the country club and that they wanted um, the density housing. That was but the, to say that. And, and, you know, that is clearly what the council, the community said, doesn't mean they couldn't be in some cases condos. Mm -hmm. uh, they wouldn't necessarily have to be rentals. The other thing is that, you know, it's a plan and a concept, as as was mentioned earlier. A developer is going to come in and say, "Here, you know, they're going to they're going to look at this. They're going to look at the land. They're going to look at the engineer, all those things, and they're going to say, here's what we think will work.' And they're going to present that to us, and then we will work with them to to get what works. You know, they're going to tell us what they can they can afford. You know, sure. what, what pencils out. And there may be partnerships where some of them are done in, in conjunction with Downstreet or somebody like that to get affordable housing. You know, there, there may be a master developer and then some 
developers doing different so so you know ideally it would be a neighborhood kind of thing where there's a bunch of different types of housing but we need we need the people that do this for real to to tell us what it's going to work you know one of the things that we heard from white and bark and talking with them is that they're they're trying to work with communities all over and people are really having a difficult time making these projects work affordably to come up with you know price points that people can have and they were they were optimistic about this because of the number of units, the potential number of units, this could, you know, as you talked about, to scale, this could, this could work because a developer would have enough units in it to make it work for them. Particularly if, if there was a mechanism like TIF or grant funds or some combination that helped buy down the cost of the infrastructure, so that they could. Are we are we talking to to prefab um, developers as well as? I mean, are, are some of these folks? Of constructing houses in factories or in panelized modules or something other than all sorts of things. Okay, all so the yeah. gamut. Yeah. I mean, there are a lot of companies doing that at at high levels of energy efficiency and right. and profitability because because they can do it at scale. Yeah. Um, yeah, we haven't been talking specifics as much as we have about because of where we are in this process. Most of our conversations have been about what types of information do you need in advance because. Mm -hmm. We're doing due diligence. We don't want to do things that aren't useful for you. We don't want to spend $50,000 on soil borings if you don't care about soil borings. What do you care about? So when we are ready to put out the RFP, we have the right information for you as the developer to be able to evaluate and make it and make a decision as to whether or not mm -hmm. you want to make that commitment to the city to, to do a project. And so those we're trying to get that information because we're not we're not developers and that's what we're trying to ascertain what 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 information do you need so we make sure we have the right information because some of them they're going to want to do themselves they're going to want to do their own market analysis they're probably not going to want our market analysis or maybe they do want us to do a market analysis but what what is it we need to do so when we put out the rfp we get the the largest group of people who are interested because we we want to have a choice we want to all give you all the opportunity to have a choice of, yeah, yeah. I, I mean, I'm not a developer either, but I just have this feeling if we do it the way we've always always done it, it's not going to work. You know, right. we need to find somebody who's got an idea, a new idea about how to go about it. And that's, I think, what we're trying to set this up is that we will get ask for proposals, get for some ideas innovation, and, yeah. and be able to, you know, if everything went perfectly, which it won't, you know, we'd be able to say we've got all this stuff set up. We've already either built or about to build the water and sewer lines to the base level. So that's all done for you. You got to say, give us a proposal for how you can make the rest of it work. And you know, we'll get all kinds of ideas, hopefully. Thank you. Uh, Tim. Yeah, hey, Mike, I'm glad to hear that's the approach you're taking at this stage. I think um, I've heard the, the term the developer a few times, and I mentioned it before, but I really think we've got to keep an open mind to having multiple phases with potentially you know different developers for each phase of this project. Um, yeah, I think the concept you mentioned, I think they'll have master developer, or maybe Mike mentioned it. Uh, we're not that big. I mean, there's just, there's not that much profit in this to have more layers added. I, I think it's important to keep a perspective that each phase is big enough to be a standalone project. If somebody's really good at the first phase and they end up being the same group we want to work with for the second phase, we'll have that option. But I, I don't think I'd tie everything up with one developer right out of the boat. And we're not making that commitment now. Obviously, we're a long ways. You know, you all will will see yeah. and approve what goes out um, before it goes out next spring. Yeah, it's just every time you mention, you say the developer, it makes me. Well, I think that's shorthand. So I appreciate that. Yeah. That's a good point. Yeah. Thanks, Tim. Uh, Phil. Uh, yes. Um, just just a quick thought back to the recreation thing. I think I heard uh, the idea earlier that perhaps you'd make some decision at the next meeting about which direction to go on the rec center. But if the uh, master capital plan isn't going to be ready till the next meeting after that, maybe it makes sense to have that in hand before you choose a direction. Thank you. Thanks. Uh, Joe. Oh. Uh, Joe, have we lost you? We may have lost. No, oh, Joe, you're still on there. You're still on there. Just put his hand down. Okay. All right. 
Um, I think we're good. Thanks. We're not, not asking for any dis decisions tonight. No, but, but if no. there's anything that you don't want us to do, oh, here's Joe. Okay, Joe, you're back. Joe Castellano. Joe, we're about to move on. So if you have something you want to say, please unmute yourself. Okay. Um, yeah, I mean, if there's any concerns about the way we're going with any of this, please let us know. Um, you know, to Phil's point about the next meeting, uh, I think the idea with the rec thing is to keep the conversation going. We've, we've been waiting for this. You know, we were going to, the hub has given us an option is to lay out what the choices are and see how you wanted to proceed with that. You know, the decision would be, how do you want to proceed next? May or may not be a final decision, but the, the idea is that we, we now, as we're coming up, we need to make some decisions. We've talked about this for a while. We've got, you know, there's the options could be just focus on Barry Street. They could be do more feasibility. They could be, um, you know, any, you know, talk to the hub about their, you know, we'll hear their proposal. So I think there's a lot of choices that you can be leading us. And we didn't want to just dump all this on you tonight to know that with regard to a, the capital plan, I'll, get, I'll talk about that more later under the manager's report. But, um, you know, certainly we can try to get a, a list together of, of potential bonds that we know about now. Uh, those can always change, but at least uh, here's some of the things that might be on the table. So I, I haven't heard anything that makes me think, well, we should stop the course we're on now. Uh, another thing to throw into it is that I do think that uh, it's, I, I think uh, everything Alan said was, uh, was valid and valuable, but I also do think that there's some issues about how much, uh, appetite people are going to have for taking on debt, um, which might militate in favor of doing the best we can in the uh, Barry Street location. But then another factor of Barry Street is that we've been talking about uh, that would be a very good location for homeless shelter. And transitional uh, housing. Transitional housing, and something like that. that. And uh, those are not compatible uses probably so that's just another factor in that conversation i think can i leave you with a one quick question what where, where is the phase two due diligence that is recommended in your report okay. i don't see an rfp out there for doing all the necessary next due diligence and it's not going to be done by staff is there an answer to that mike yeah you don't have to answer yeah, I mean, to to a certain extent, what we had was the the council had allocated, I believe, one hundred and fifty thousand towards uh, advancing stuff. The TIF is going to be fifty, sixty thousand, we're guessing, and so we had a hundred thousand for due diligence. And in our conversations with the Public Works Department, they felt that there's a certain amount of work that can be done uh, in conjunction with uh, they did new RFP process. So they have this bigger RFP process, so they don't have to keep putting out RFPs over and over again. Um, they have everybody, they're scored. We can work with whoever is the top candidate in that category who has already been awarded and we can move forward on the list. So that's when we're talking about, we're already talking to somebody. We're talking to, I believe, VHB, who right. actually was part of the White and Burke process, but they also were the winner for, the, for that Right. work so they're going to be the ones who are going to be scoping that out working with um yeah the water the water company there's a water engineering right. firm that so, is going to be handling the water side so okay. we you were handling everything on the list yeah that's uh, that's that's what i thought good to get it out there all right thanks folks um it is 809 i think there's a good likelihood that the next item uh, could take us beyond our uh, 
eight thirty break time. So I'm gonna say let's take our eight thirty break at eight oh nine and be back here at the eight twenty meeting to order again. We are up to our next item on the agenda, which is third reading of uh, proposal for the uh, responsible contractor ordinance. And Kurt, I'm assuming you're, it's all you on this? It is. I'll just um, remind the council that I could send out even um, copies of. So, so the last meeting, um, we were told that Barry and um, Burlington had followed us, I think. Um, so we did a little digging into that. And what we learned was that Burlington had actually preceded us, had, and I think our ordinance was based on Burlington's. And then after their experience, they amended their ordinance to a much simpler ordinance to what they have now. And I set that out. And then Barry has an ordinance that is slightly different. I, I sent them out to you, I think, yesterday. So it's it factors this in um, as a as a factor, but it's not as hard a, a line. So those were the two that we had heard about. We did chase down, and I think you've got all that. So just wanted to point that out, and I'll turn it over to you. Thanks, and I will um, open our public hearing. Kurt, okay. Thanks. I'm Kurt Modica, Public Works Director. Um, so again, just to recap on this, the, the City of Montpelier has uh, an ordinance um, that uh, requires um, pay scales for contracts uh, for employees doing contracts over 200,000. Um, and um, we've just had, you know, we've discussed at other meetings, some concerns, uh, the financial position that the city's in currently um, with the two floods and the pandemic. Um, we're heading into what you'll see soon is a, a challenging capital plan. Um, a lot of deferred equipment and deferred paving projects. Um, so there's a lot of need and, um, you know, this, does have an impact on uh, on our ability to do um, projects, or at least the number of projects that we can do financially. Um, so just to follow up what Bill mentioned, um, so Burlington's model is now, it's more like a minimum wage. So one rate um, that everybody has to at least be paid that amount, uh, which to me is a much simpler way to manage it. It's easier for contractors to manage, and it's more equitable, I believe, um, to employees. Um, so, uh, and then Barry city, I don't believe has actually implemented theirs and, um, it is a little more complicated, but it's more of like a system where if people go through the process and commit to following the wage rates, then, um, then they may win the bid over someone else that did submit that information. Um, but again, I don't think that's really been implemented and so there's not a lot of case study on that. But one other thing I wanted to mention is that I, didn't have a lot of time to call contractors, but I did call one small contractor. Um, he has a crew of about six local. And uh, I just asked him, you know, would would this ordinance as it currently stands um, present a barrier for you to bid projects at Montpelier? And he said, absolutely. I, I'm generally on the excavator. Like, I don't have time to, you know, manage the different pay scales for different employees doing different functions. So he has not been a project for the city um, since this was implemented. And I, my concern is um, there's a lot of small contractors like that in, in rural Vermont. And so we're through this ordinance really creating, um, you know, more, uh, just really work for larger, uh, larger contracts that have the contractors that have a, the overhead staff to manage this. Thanks, Kurt. Um, one of the things that uh, I am, interested in is that uh, at our last meeting uh representative casey was here and we talked about whether it would be possible for him to uh sit down with with you and maybe someone from the flcio uh to talk about whether it would be possible to amend the ordinance to uh reduce the uh the paperwork requirements yet still achieve the goals of uh maintaining uh reasonable and fair wage rates for uh people working on city uh contracts and uh was it possible to have 
any of those conversations? <clears throat> no, I have not had any discussions um, with them directly on that. You know, I think it would be helpful if uh, if there was uh, maybe a direction from council out of what how best to approach that. Do we is there interest from council in following the model that Burlington has adopted? Um, so I like that model just because it takes away the tracking of individual employees doing different types of tasks, which is really what drives um, small contractors from bidding on projects here. And so what do they do? Do they say, do they have a minimum level of uh, uh, wage rate that they certify that everybody working on this job is getting paid at least X dollars per hour? That's correct. And they update it annually. And do you know what that uh, X dollars per hour is? I don't off the top of my head. Okay. Uh, thanks. Um, I saw Tim's hand first, so I'll get get to you and then Sal and then Carrie. Thanks. So just clarify, because I'm sorry, I missed the last meeting, but it, it, the, so what this is the third reading on is, weren't we putting the ordinance on hold for two years? It was that, that is, we started. Um, that is the proposal as it stands. Okay. And so the, the refinement of the ordinance it's also something that can happen over time then if we have two years to work yeah. through. Oh, you're totally right. That's one thing that could happen. Another thing that could happen is if there were an alternative proposal, then somebody could make that as a motion too. But uh, so I'm just trying to make sure we're having a full discussion of the issues that are before us. So. Um, or does the... Uh... Does the Burlington, uh, I think our, our ordinance currently says that um, a certain wage rate is to be used, the Vermont uh, rate and the Vermont state rate and and the cash equivalent of benefits. Does the Burlington revised model include the benefit cash equivalent? Which I think is a major obstacle for small six crew contractors as well. Often because not only is it more expensive for them, but but the crew doesn't want it. They they think they're going to live forever, and they don't need a four hundred one k and yada yada. So they they'd rather have you put it in the envelope. Yeah, I think I'd need to double check that. I believe there is a benefit component in there, but uh, we don't have a copy of the certain. Burlington ordinance. Yeah. But yeah, I sent it to you. I just don't have it. Yeah. I and I think the the way it worked under our ordinance, and I'm I, I stand to be corrected because I'm not an expert on it, was that the wage rate they, they didn't require people to have benefits. It just said if you don't have benefits, then it's an additional 30 or 40 percent wage rate. So it basically made up for that com compensation. So an employee still would get it in the envelope. It would just be a higher rate. And I think you know, the argument for that, or is that if if the the bidder knows that going in and bases their price on those wage rates, then it's not costing the con, you know, they're getting the money through the payment of the contract because they bid it at that rate. I think the the the, the real obstacle has I mean, so I think there's two two separate questions. One is the sort of ease of use and then, you know, are we chasing off contractors? And then two is, you know, is it making projects too expensive by people bidding. And so I think those are two kind of separate questions. And, you know, they're all both, we don't really, I don't think we're ever going to have hard data on either one of them. I think, you know, it's, it's, so that's, I think what's we're talking about. Gary. Um, thank you for that last clarification, Bill. I think you're absolutely right. Those are two different uh, potential obstacles that we're talking about is one is, is it, are we not getting the bids that we would want because it's the contractors think this is too administratively burdensome? And two, do we actually want to pay the that amount? Um, and so those are, I think it's really important to be very clear about those. So I think that this this ordinance was put in place because we, as a city, decided that it was it aligned with our values that we do want to pay prevailing wage for these projects. So I think that that question about whether we actually want to pay for this is um, is answered already by the fact that the ordinance exists. 
if we have changed our minds about that and we no longer feel that we can afford to pay prevailing wages, then we should just get rid of the ordinance altogether. There's no point in putting it off for two years. We should just say, no, we're not, it doesn't align with our values anymore. If it's, if the administrative burden is something that we want to address, then I think that there's a variety of ways to do that. I would, I'm, I, um, I think we probably could get better data about whether or not we're, we're getting, that's an obstacle to people putting in bids, but um, I can believe that looking at the way it is now, asking the way we structured it with the sign in and sign out and everything looks like a real pain. I can, I can see that. Um, we had talked last week about the idea that maybe we could get rid of that part of the ordinance. We could amend it so that that is no longer re a requirement. Um, I also really appreciate that we've got the Barry and the Burlington policies here because the Barry one includes a provision that says the city manager can waive this at any point during the process based on certain conditions, which could be, I mean, it's it's listed in here, but they it's pretty broad. Um, and it seems like we could, sorry, let me just pull it up. Um, get it for um, only can, the, the work can only be performed by specific vendors for whatever reason, no other responsible or responsive bidders are identified. Um, an emergency situation, loss of available funding, among other things. So there's a lot of conditions under which, which I think we may be fall, we may find ourselves falling into right now. If we're getting one bid uh, on a project, then maybe we say, okay, we're waiving it for this project, but to build that into the ordinance rather than to have the council say across the board, we're waiving it for all of them for two years, regardless of what happens, I'm not okay with. Um, and then I just want to clarify about the Burlington ordinance. It's a livable wage ordinance. It requires a livable wage and that's it. So that's very different from prevailing wage. It's a lot less than prevailing wage for construction projects. As we've been talking, I found it, and it's fifteen dollars and eighty three cents yeah. an hour. So I, I don't think that's a good that's model. Not, I don't think it's a comparable model. That's, that's not very high, yeah. Yeah. Um. Any members of the public who wish to be heard on this, since this is a public hearing. Yeah, I'll be ever, ever so brief, Steve Whitaker. I, again, want to make sure that we're not dissuading contractors from bidding. we got a lot of work ahead of us with the whole state, with uh, a lot of projects. And if we're, if we only got one or one bid for School Street, imagine what's going to happen uh, if we make it more complicated for the contractors. So I'm, I don't have a position. I appreciate uh, Carrie's uh, well-reasoned uh, support of making sure that the values are per sustained here, and that can be done through waivers or uh, a, a more surgical approach to waivers. But I don't want to create a situation where we're not getting competition because uh, we'll end up not getting our projects done because we ran out of money on the few projects that consume the budget. Any other member of the public present or online who would like to be heard? Okay, seeing none, I'll close the public hearing. And council, we have uh, options. Lauren. Yeah, I mean, I, I still strongly support the values that underpin this, that as a community, we want to be paying a fair wage for the work for people coming into our community. Um, you know, and we've heard repeatedly, you know, these kinds of jobs that folks can't even live in our city at the wages that they're sometimes getting paid. Um, I like the idea of trying to work to simplify it. It does sound overly burdensome and that that is one factor in getting fewer bids. I think the idea of a simplified um, 
policy paired with a waiver process. So when we have extend extenuating circumstances like a massive flood and other things that you would have some flexibility in how it's implemented and that that could be, you know, brought to council for big projects that, you know, we're planning to waive that, that requirement in this case because of these circumstances. I think that is a reasonable approach to maintain the values, but give yourself the ability to be, you know, if there's some big, and it seems like the kind of examples that the Barry ordinance gives us some language. So, I mean, for, for me, I'd love to move in that direction. If, you know, the majority of council votes today to put it on hold, like as Jack said, I guess people could keep working on an alternative and bring it back to, to be considered um, at any point. But I mean, I'll be voting against the suspension at this point, but if we keep it in place, it sounds like it should be fixed um, and improved no matter what. So I think that's that's the direction I'm leaning right now. And yeah. Thanks, Lauren. Anybody else? So, well, I too like the idea of, I mean, I, not, I guess not too, since you, you might not like that idea. I like the idea of putting it on hold while we try and fix it, because I frankly don't think we can afford it. We just spent a, an excruciating budgeting process trying to trying to save, what, one and a half million dollars we had to take out at one point. If we're talking about two million dollars over the next two years, and it's not like it's all in one chunk, but contract by contract for those two projects, that's that money has to come from someplace. So if it if we have to pay it for infrastructure work, we can't spend it someplace else. And we just don't, I don't see where we where we have it. We're we're just in a in a fix. Um I think I think the the prevailing wage does align with our values. I just don't think we can afford it. If there's a way we can fix it, let's try and fix it, but let's suspend it until we have a, a version that we think will um will better better fit our budget and and encourage more more competition uh for the for the work that we have. Is someone going to make a motion? Tim. Yeah, I'll make a motion that we suspend the prevailing wage ordinance for two years and study it and carefully uh, design how it will move forward. Is there a second? Second. It it feels like everyone who wants to say something about this has already said it over the previous se several conversations about this, but I don't want to foreclose debate. Is there any further, any discussion about the motion before we uh, move to a vote? Okay. Um, we, we will do a roll call. We will proceed by roll call. Um, Adrian? Terry? No. Sal? Yes. Tim? Yes. Palin? Yes. And Lauren? No. Motion carries uh, four to two. Okay. That is it. Thank you. Uh, yes. So what what will the process be now to try and revise it? I mean, will we will we have a working group or how how do we come up with it and, and how will we go about uh, amending it? Well, things are kind of wide open at this point. Mm -hmm. We have two years and if anyone the motion wants did to work include on it, studying and designing how it could be improved. Yeah. Okay. So that would be we'd maybe come back to his suggestions for that. Uh -huh. Okay, next up, part, parking ordinance, third reading, um, Kelly. And I, uh, as you're walking up, I will open the public hearing. Great, okay. Um, Kelly Murphy, Assistant City Manager. I am going to go over just uh, where we're at uh, with the parking ordinance. Um, so in the packet, there's an overview of the changes that have been made to date with the parking ordinance. Um, 
for this third reading, um, the items that we took a look at uh, were clarifying language associated with section 10-708 um, for determination of parking over time. I can read that language if you'd like, or we can just move ahead. So I'm gonna keep going unless you'd like me to read it. Um, and then the second section that we took a look at um, was section 10-719B, which was the parking violation hearing appeal process. Uh, we added language to include duration for those hearings um, and to provide detail on what type of hearing it would be, whether it be remote or in person and how you can make that request. Um, and then the last was to address um, some of the gender specific language to be gender neutral and non-binary. Um, and that was really in section 10-724. Um, so I'm happy to go over any of the changes at this point or take questions. Any questions from any members of the council? Any comments for any, any members of the public? Steve. Yeah, Steve Whitaker again. I think I was instrumental in uh, convincing y'all you needed to revise this, but this doesn't come anywhere near close to due process or even due diligence by the folks who are pretending to amend it. Uh, there is no uh, objective, uh, impartial hearing uh, body convened by this ordinance to hear appeals. There, there needs to be somebody who knows the rules of evidence. There's no clarification of how evidence is entered in, which is what I've been trying to do. You know, I've been trying to enter evidence since 2019 that the fire hydrant was 12 feet or more that from the vehicle, whereas our police say six feet from a fire hydrant, and there was no yellow curb to indicate that that's a fire hydrant zone. And y'all just don't care enough to do your due diligence and do this process properly. So your violent, your ordinance is in violation of constitutional due process protections and it's half-assed attempt. And it's a bear putting more crap on top of crap that has accumulated over years. And you really need to do this right and you obviously don't care because I've spoken about it at the first hearing and you're you're not listening. So I'm disgusted with the level of management that we're paying top dollar for and that y'all are willing to eat it, you know? Are there comments from any other members of the public? Seeing none, I will close our public hearing. Um, council members, are we... Ready to vote on this proposal. Is there a motion to approve the uh, proposed amendments? Lauren. Um, I move we adopt the proposed amendments to the parking ordinance as presented. Is there a second? All, any, any discussion before we move to a vote? All those in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay, thank you. We have completed work on that. Thank you. Next, we're to item number 10, uh, holiday meeting schedule which in our packets. Uh, Bill, that's you, I assume? Yep, let me just pull that up. Um, so we do this every year about now, uh, because as the calendar falls, typically uh, with with Thanksgiving being the fourth Thursday, uh, we usually don't want to meet the fourth Wednesday. And then Christmas always falls uh, usually that fourth week of December. and We usually don't want to meet that week. So um, we typically move the meeting a week up. In, in Thanksgiving and a week up in, in uh, December as well uh, for Christmas. One thing that I'm proposing that's a little bit different, it's part of the quirk of the calendar, is because January 1st is a Wednesday, that means January 8th is technically the second Wednesday, which would normally be our regular meeting. I'm Usually our first meeting after the holidays is still a budget workshop. So I'm proposing that we 
continue that as a budget workshop and actually have the following week be the regular meeting. And then we do have to move the the other meeting up because of the petition deadlines. Although I think that actually falls this year to the fourth week. So it's not a problem. Uh, but basically we'd have the regular meetings on the third and fourth week holding this, the second Wednesday for a budget workshop. So that's the only quirk of the calendar this year. And then otherwise, and I think the only other caveat is, is legally the deadline for petitions is Thursday, the 23rd. And so in the event that we, some years we've held our final public hearing and everything on that Thursday night, just had a Thursday night meeting instead of a Wednesday night, which we could also do. Uh, I think last year what we did, and maybe the last couple of years, we just held it on a regular Wednesday. And if a petition came in just once, we just held a special meeting, a Zoom meeting, you know, a five minute meeting at five o'clock to accept the petition and add it to the, mm -hmm. the warning. Uh, and so I, I just want to point those out. Um, I think in some ways, that's easier. I, you know, people are following a budget process and then they, why is your last final hearing on a Thursday night? So it's easier if people can follow on Wednesday. I think it's so, also, so that's the people, members of council have Wednesdays built into right. their schedule. Yeah. So that's my recommendation, but obviously uh, you all can schedule these however you want. Might not get much attendance on the fourth Wednesday of November and December, but that might you know. work for everybody. So we'll need a motion to approve this. Terry. I, I'm sorry, I just I'm, I may have missed missed it, but um December 19th or December 18th? December 19th looks like a Thursday. I'm sorry, yes, it should be December. Okay, just yeah, okay. to yes. make sure. Thank you. Good okay. catch. With that amendment. Number 20. Okay. So were you getting ready to raise your hand, Adrian? No, I just wanted to, I just made sure that it was right in my calendar. Mm -hmm. Yep. Yeah. All right. Is there a motion to approve this schedule as a, as amended? Uh so moved. Is there a second? Second. Any further discussion? All those in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay. We don't have other business that I'm aware of. So we can move to council reports. And because we've got so many people in the room on this side, Adrian, you're up. Uh, nothing for me. Hey, Terry. Sal. Uh, no. uh, Tim. Nope. Thanks. Uh, Paywin. Lauren. Uh, just a reminder, tomorrow evening, the Montpelier Commission for Recovery and Resilience. Uh, so Thursday evening is having our next public forum, um, trying to gather feedback on the MAPO plan, the emergency response for city and community. So um, that's 6.30 p.m. at the high school tomorrow night. So I hope people can make it out. And there will be other ways to provide feedback if you can't make it. Thanks. Great, thanks. Um, I've just got a couple of things. One, I wanted to note, uh, that uh, we received a check from the Montpelier Housing Authority in the amount of $14,688.42 as a payment in lieu of taxes for Pioneer Apartments on, uh, on Main Street. And there was a long time when the Montpelier Housing Authority, I believe, was the only tax-exempt property owner that was actually paying taxes. I'm not sure if they are now, but... Uh, I certainly appreciate the uh, payments we received from uh, from the housing authority. Um, and we all, the other thing I'll note, and other people may also note it, that uh, we now have a retail post office uh, location right here in Montpelier. And uh, soft opening the, just this past Monday, and I visited there and uh, there will be a grand opening on uh, on Saturday morning. Um, 
what I've heard is that there will be coffee cake and balloons. I don't know what else there are going to be, if there's uh, going to be speakers or anything. I uh, haven't heard anything from the post office about the inviting me or any other members of city government to it, but it might be uh, a nice thing to be there anyway. Um, but it's good news for the people of Montpelier. Um, city clerk. Just uh, note that voting is underway. It's reasonably robust. We've gotten about a thousand ballots back so far, um, so it's 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 happening. I uh, encourage folks to send in their ballots, and if they don't want to send in their ballots, um, they'd rather vote um, on election day. It's uh, easier and better and quicker if you were to bring the ballots you were sent and vote with those. Um, otherwise, you have to sign a little thing that says, I'm not trying to vote twice, a little affidavit. But so that's a little little slower. But uh, yeah, that's it. And, and people's uh, early ballots are getting checked in as they come in, right? Yes. Thanks to wonderful volunteers. Not exactly as they come in, but we are gradually moving through them. Um, it's just the volunteer turnout for the few weeks leading up to the election. And the election is just enormous. It's just been incredible. Um, I've, I've, you know, we always have good volunteers and I always run these elections with volunteers, but I've never seen anything like this one. So it's, um, it's nice, it's great to see. So all you voters out there, if you get your ballot in early, then that will stop you from getting get out the vote calls from the from the parties because they'll know you have already voted. So that's a little incentive. Um, yeah, don't promise that. Yeah. <laughs> so, well, <laughs> city manager's report. Um, to that end, I got a text from Maine, um, a 207 phone number during this meeting saying, that you don't have much time left. This election is extremely tight, tight, and Trump needs your vote to win. So I was guess that people in Maine they want me to go to Maine to vote for, for Trump. So <laughs> I don't know if that's voter fraud or not. Right, I'm registered there. Um, I actually have uncharacteristically a lot of things tonight. So try to bear with me. Uh, some are announcements and some are questions. Uh, so one announcement is, uh, and they're in just the order that I've written them down here. Uh, you, you noticed in the uh, presentation about the Country Club Road housing that we were trying to make it the top regional priority. Those applications are actually due this week. We didn't have it on the agenda, but I just want to make it clear that that is what we're pushing for. If it does become the top regional priority, then it, it is in great position for the uh, Northern Borders Grant for a couple million dollars. So I, I, I would, given all our prior votes on this, I assume that was the case, but wanted to mention it. Um, I sent you out an email from Central Vermont Home Health and Hospice about how to handle their ballot. And last year we didn't vote to put them on the ballot. I think. Um, so the I think their question is, do they petition or do they get put on the ballot? They want to know sooner than later so they can petition if they need to. And I said, I would ask and that it was possible that we get an answer or it was possible that you would ask to have it put on a future agenda. And that I'll get back to them tomorrow. Karen. So I was reviewing the, the history and the and the policy and I, um, I, I don't, we didn't, I don't remember voting to change the policy, right. that the policy was that if they were not asking for any additional money that we would automatically put it on the ballot. I didn't either, but I wanted to make sure. Yeah. I mean, I'm, I'm personally not a giant fan of that whole process. And I think it's worth t talking about the whole process in, in our budget process. But I think for now that is, that is the case and they're not asking for anything additional so that they, according to our current policy, they shouldn't have to petition. Yeah. 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 It, yeah. Although if, if we wanted to change that, I agree, we should figure that out very quickly. But I, I don't know if that's realistic. How many hours? We spent? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Thank you. Um, another one. Interesting. Confluence Park. I know we've already voted on this. The question came. So there are grants out there. 
and Akasha Ranjo asked me whether basically was it the city council didn't want to spend the money or they don't want to do the project, i.e. if I can raise the full sum of money with without city needing to do it, are you still okay with doing the project? And the reason for the some you know sort of urgency is that she's got to report to people who are holding funds for this to release them. I said, I don't know, so I will ask the powers that be. So, it needs to be warned as an agenda item. I thought we voted to terminate the project. But you did. And so I I think the question whether they have the money or not. Okay. Is, is that was my understanding. But so I guess that's maybe others. I agree. That I mean, you did vote to terminate the project. For sure. Yes. And I think the question, did that mean terminate the project? Mm -hmm. I'm seeing... Because I agree, if we're going to reconsider it, we should put it on an agenda. So I just wanted to see if they, people agreed that determination was determination. Lauren? I might suggest, I mean, knowing that one of the projects, and there's lots of conversations happening about the whole river's edge, so like the... Commission for Recovery and Resilience, and there's lots of conversations with the state um, who obviously owns a big chunk of the land along there, like maybe recommend to Kasha to go to, to talk to the people working on that project and just see if there's, I don't know how long she could hold money, but I mean, I could see like a different kind of iteration of a proposal coming back that a future iteration of council might be interested in. So to, to just say, don't tell like, no way, never, but there might be. I don't know. Like I just think there's gonna be future yeah, conversations I think there's happening. Some and really so, needs to know yeah, quickly. so she might have to for that forfeit, but I I think she should be in conversation with the other processes okay. going on. And that's what I will tell her. That's fine. Um let's see. We talked about the capital plan tonight. I just wanted to update everybody quickly on where we are with that. We are working to put together a capital plan. Uh, the committee is Lauren, Carey, and Tim. Uh, and we are hoping to get that group together in October this year, end of October, a couple of weeks. No, no date yet to uh, work. Last couple of years, just because of timing, it's really sort of been, here's our plan. What do you think of it? This year, I think we're going to have options and try to work with the committee to put together the plan with the idea that we'd bring at least a preliminary plan to the council on November 13, uh, so that people could see it. Uh, but we are, you know, adding the projects and all that kind of thing. So that's, that's what's happening. And I thought a good point tonight for us to get a long list of potential bonds over the next few years um, to just have to work that. So that's happening. Um, we have some bonds that are actually being retired in the next few years. Yep, too. we do. So exactly. But so uh, getting a full picture, very good. Right. Um let's see. Uh Sal did a bang up job representing the community at the VLCT annual meeting. Um uh, right away. He jammed, <laughs> he rammed everything through. That got everything passed. Um I think. Uh, more importantly, though, that the the board, the league board, did sort of sign on to this effort to push state on homelessness efforts. So it's not just sort of the communities, the loose consortium of communities, but it's the League of Cities and Towns as a whole. Um, so that's helpful. Which brings me to uh, the homelessness meeting that we're going to have next week, the workshop. I have invited state uh, Chris Winters and his team. I've invited uh, all our our um, elected officials, our state reps. Um, my thought is that we would ask the state administration what their plan is, what they are doing, what, you know, they've had this thing, and then perhaps take um, take that list of requests that were made by those communities, or including us, and simply say, you know, go down through them and say, is this feasible? This is feasible, you know, kind of these are recommendations, both short and long, because some of them are legislative, some of them are administrative. And see, you know, at least use that as a framework for the conversation. And then obviously there will be other things that will come up and we'll want to talk. But that would be kind of the loose agenda for that meeting. And but if there's anything else or any people had a different vision of how to do that workshop, then you know.
Okay. Just not remembering off the top of my head. Does that list include all of the recommendations that our homelessness task force? We could put those in too. I, I just wondered, like, add those to our list right. as well to ask the administration about and yep. see. Um, I think I'm almost done. Uh, yeah. So the last one is budget. Um, I just also wanted to go over where uh, where we were working on the budget. So we will be talking about the budget at the next couple of meetings. So this is more of just a preview. So our next, our plan, the next meeting is to outline some, you know, high, some what we know, and also for you to be thinking and to give us feedback of how you would like the budget process to go. You know, we had some talk last year about wanting to make some changes, but we never really settled on what those were. So the next meeting, part of the idea would be, how would we like to see this roll out? The the meeting after that on November 13, um, our goal, what we're shooting for is that is right before you, you all hear us talk about the budget Congress that we do, the staff meeting that we work on this. So that's going to be right before we do that. And so we're hoping that we will have a full draft of at least the general fund um, of what we will be looking at and what we're hoping to do is share that with you all before we go into those meetings. So, I mean, it will be a big. Which meeting is that? November 13th. November 13th. It'll be a big, huge number. And, you know, basically it's going to be, you know, Sal mentioned we had to cut a million and a half. It's going to be like that or more probably this year. So it's going to be, you know, is there anything you'd like to weigh in as we are go about to do our work? How does this, do you have any feedback for us as we then sit down as a staff to do this? So that, you know, I think last year, just through the iterations of the process, we did our thing and then came through and the council said, gee, we really didn't want to cut anything in the police, fire and public works. Like, okay, well, so you know, have those kind of conversations in advance of this meeting. So make sure we're reflecting the goals and priorities of the council. So having said that, um, like I said, we'll have more detail, but just so that you're thinking, um, you know, we know that we need to increase our capital by you know, $300,000 for paving or whatever, our equipment probably by 300,000, actually even more, we're probably looking at this over a couple of year period, two more bumps to get the, uh, to where we need to be. Those are both big, large jumps. Um, we cut everything, you know, all those lines out of the budget. So if there's a thought to put, you know, housing trust fund money back in or uh, lobbyists or the arts fund, any of those things, those all got zeroed out last year, homelessness task or all that stuff. So if, as we think about that, um, if those come back in, those are starting from zero. We've been told that, um, that uh, our health insurance right now is a 23% increase. It's gonna be a huge unsustainable jump. Uh, and I think people all around are hearing that. Uh, and you know, we know we were short some positions, so we would probably start with, you know, at least what we think we need for staffing. So I'm just telling you this because, you know, I think Sal mentioned hellscape or something. I don't know if you, know if you said it or we were thinking, or maybe we said it in the office today, but it's <laughs> it's going to be, it's going to be, you know, a lot of fun again this year too. So um, buckle up. It's going to be a, a bumpy ride and um, a lot of tough decisions to make. So part of the reason I just flagged that, we'll go, we'll go into those more detail next meeting, but also to talk about our process. Ideally, November 3rd, I mean, November 13th, we'll have hard numbers to share with you to get some guidance from you. And then on December 11th, we present the actual budget presentation and then uh, we're off to the races. So on that note, I'm done. <laughs> oh boy. All right. Um, and at 9.05 p.m., we are adjourned. Yeah, thanks, everybody.